Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to House Talk Pregame. I am your host, sports mental health empowerment coach, Dr. Lauren Pitts, my forever ride or die co host, Ronnie Ransom. Uh, it's Saturday. It's Saturday, and what a week it has been. Uh, we have so much that we are going to cover today. I will tell you that my heart is heavy. Um, my heart is very, very heavy. Um, but before I share that with you, um, just want to give you, you know, our normal background of what HT pregame is all about. Um, you know, we we pride ourselves on things that are important to us as persons of black and brown hue all across the nation and, and all around the world. And this really is what pregame is all about. It's all about family. It's about your family. It's about our family. It's about our collaborative family as persons of color um, all across the nation and all around the world. And week after week, uh, we're having what we consider to be, and, and from the feedback we're receiving from you, we know what you consider to be the hard conversations on topics that are relevant, um, that are very relevant to our black and brown communities globally, including our HBCU families, um, scholar and professional athletes and their families, and our Heritage Sports Radio Network family. We um, are grateful, we are honored, we are humbled, and we are so appreciative that you join us each week to get this powerful, albeit raw, we know that it's raw, um, life, sports, and mental health information that is desperately needed to help you to make well-informed, not only athletic, but life-transforming decisions. And we also don't want you to forget that we compete with ourselves every week at this same time. Um, you can catch us on Heritage Sports Radio Network, uh, call sign HSRN, every Saturday at this time, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and 10 p.m. Um, on Saturdays, as well as on Sundays at 6 p.m. Um, we have a great show lined up for you today, and Ronnie's gonna tell you about that in just a moment. Um, but I would like to take a moment to share our heartbreak and our heartfelt sympathy and condolences for the family of James A. Watson, um, who is a childhood friend of mine um, from Salem, New Jersey. Um, he was also the best man uh, in my my first marriage, you all have heard me talk, you know, that I was previously married and lost my former husband to um, to the disease of addiction. Um, so my heart is broken. Uh, folk are leaving here, Ronnie. They are leaving here faster than we can keep up. Um, I want to give our, our sympathy and our condolences to the Watson family, also to the Brooks family. His oldest child, Takoya, um, is my cousin, uh, her mother, Tiffany. My heart goes out to my family as well because James was a part of our family and had been a part of our family for over 30 years. He was a dear friend and a trusted confidant and just a good dude. Um, he was Virginia Commonwealth alum. He was a scholar athlete. He was um, a member of the Phi Delta chapter of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Um, he was a son. He was a brother. He was a father. He was a friend. He was an educator, Ronnie. Um, he was a coach. He was a mentor to vulnerable youth and the list goes on and on and on very 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 active um, in the community and just a heart of gold ronnie 
he had a heart of gold. My sister and I were talking this morning and she said, you know, you know how you can be in a crowded room and you couldn't see James, but you could hear that laugh and you would know that that fool was coming from wow. across the room. He was one of those people that had that distinct and infectious laugh. Um, he had this distinct voice and he was just a sweetheart of a guy and I reflect, and he was good looking. Brother was fine, he was fine. Uh, you know, he, 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 was, he was fine, fine, fine. Um, and just loved by everybody as, you know, my sister was sharing this convergence mm -hmm. on our hometown of, of Salem, New Jersey from just the class of 1987 of Salem High School and his frat brothers from all over the country are going to be stepping at the set, like, just, and I'm just getting chills and full because you heard me say last week, Ronnie, that I believe in giving people their roses while they can smell them. And I know that because James was the way he was, folk just loved on him all the time anyway. But my hope is that he is just smiling down from heaven and just seeing the outpouring of love and support and admiration and honor that literally people from all over the country are providing for his children, the rest of his family, for our hometown, like folk are just showing mad love. Um, and it is just such a great, 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 great loss. So I wanted to take a moment to to, to honor him and his memory and to just love on them. Um, to the children, to Nellie and Clarence and Liz and his mother and the mother of his children, um, you have our deepest sympathy, our deepest condolences. We love you, we love him and please know that we are with you in spirit, even though we couldn't be there today. Ronnie. <clears throat> um, thank you for that, you know, that heartfelt message. And, you know, once again, my condolences to you and his family, his, his children, his wife, you know, I know me and you had talked beforehand and, you know, like you said, you know, it, we, we have to take care of ourselves as, as black men and, yeah. I'm definitely going to get into that during our mental health tip of the week, yeah. um, because a lot of people, we, especially athletes, we fail to realize how much our physical health impacts our mental health. Mm -hmm. yep. um, but, you know, you know, shout out to his family. Shout out to him. He sat, you know, when you were describing him, he sounded like a, an amazing gentleman, an amazing guy. And, you know, lost a good one. So, yeah. you know, my heart is out to you, his family. My condolences to you and your to hit to you and his family as well um and you know my prayers are with you you know it, it's, it's always hard to lose a good friend you know um and like you said you know we have to give people their roses while they're still here because you know we we just never know we we never know when it's gonna be that last conversation that last hug that last dap up we just yep. never know so that's why we should always appreciate it no matter what um <clears throat> so you know, as we as we move on, um, like Dr. Pitt said, we have a great show lined up for you today. A lot of, you know, deep conversations. Um, our topic for today is, you know, time management is critical. Um, and for, you know, all my male student athletes, you know, one of the things our coaches always harp on us as freshmen is time management and why it's so important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're definitely going to be talking about well, why is time management so important, especially as a student athlete, especially when you're a freshman and establishing a routine? Um, and not only that time management for your sports and your academics, but also like we talked about last week, that work-life balance, having yeah. time management to be social, having time management to spend time with family, and even have a long time for yourself. That's just as important as spending time with society. So we're definitely going to be fleshing a lot of that out today and, you know, providing some tips and also some things that can hinder time management, such as mental illnesses, such as ADHD, anxiety, depression, and things like that. So we're going to flesh all that out for you as well today. Um, and we also have, um, you know, we have our mental health tip of the week. I have mine. Um, Dr. Pitts will also share hers. Um, and then also, we also have uh, some college news this week, some unfortunate news and, and what has really been a hot topic on social media for the last two weeks. 
Uh, we'll get into that in a few seconds. So, um, you know, Dr. Pitch, you ready to get into this mental health tip of the week? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I just want to put the emphasis, Ronnie, on the importance of holistic care and, you know, particularly you know, with the loss of, of James, I find myself reflecting upon how many friends and family members and, you know, my former husband and a former fiance, um, men, black men that didn't always take proper care of themselves. And, and to, to you guys credit, you know, your work ethic is through the roof, your work, 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 work. And, you know, James was a worker. He working, 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 just literally like nose to the grind, just plow, 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 plow. But at some point in time, you've got to stop. You have to rest. You have to take care of yourself. You have to heed the doctor's warnings. You have to get your routine checkups. You have to eat properly. You have to exercise. You have to, you have to take care of yourself, mind, body, and spirit. Because when you don't, you leave here too early. You leave here far too early. And I feel like when folks are when folks make their 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 mental well-being um, a priority, and I say mental well-being from the context of not like mental illness or anything like that, but I say well-being from the standpoint of putting pride aside, right? And recognizing mm -hmm. that resting doesn't make you less of a man. Absolutely. Doing what the doctor said doesn't make you less of a man. You wanting to take the necessary steps to prolong life so that you can be, and yeah, it is sort of selfish, right? But, but 52, 52 is too young to be leaving here. And I get yeah. it. I don't get it twisted. Y'all know that, that we got fearing on this show. We are. I also know though, that God is, is, is a gracious God and he's a gentleman and he gives us free choice. He gives us free will and we can do what we want to do. So if we don't want to listen and, and go to the doctor and take proper care of ourselves, he'll let us not take proper care of ourselves. But our bodies are the temple. Our bodies are sacred and, and precious and we have to take care of ourselves. That is my mental health tip that when you're not well in your physical body, it wears on your emotional state. It's cyclical, Ronnie. If, and then when you're worn out and you're tired and exhausted mentally, your body breaks down more. And then you don't wake up one day. And that, that's what's so heartbreaking to me. It's so heartbreaking to me that so many people that I love and care about could possibly have been here much longer had they just taken better care of themselves. And I need y'all to do that. We need y'all. We Life is hard. Yeah. Life is hard, bro. Yeah, and it's so hard, and we need we need our fathers, we need our husbands, we need our brothers, we need our friends. Life is kicking our behind as women of color, and we can't navigate this life properly without you guys' love and support. And we need you here. We need you guys here. I'm sorry. It's, it's not. 
Definitely understand. And, and, and you, you, you made a great point and, and it's true, you know, and I think, you know, speaking as an African-American male who, you know, I'll be honest, I know most people when they, you know, watch this show or listen to us, they can't see me or they can't see me, you know, standing, you know, I'm six, one around 300. You know, I, I've been, I've been big my entire life, I've been obese my entire life. Um, so, you know, physical health for me has always been a, uh, a priority topic of mine because, you know, on my dad's side, you know, I can't tell you how many diseases run on his side, whether it's high blood pressure, hypertension, um, heart disease, uh, diabetes. Um, he lost both his parents to diabetes. You know, he has diabetes. Um, and so, you know, when, when we talk about things like that and, and we really sit there and look at, you know, um, how important our physical health is for our mental health. And, and I'll be honest with you, and, and I'm pretty sure for our listeners out there listening, those who have played sports before can definitely feel me when I say this. And I, I'm actually a current victim of this right now and I'm trying to change it, but it is a lot easier said than done. One of the things that I've noticed, and, and somebody can, and you might call this an excuse, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm holding myself accountable to it because I'm victim to it. So, you know, excuse or not, at least I'm aware of it. So one of the things that I've noticed about myself and just talking with a lot of, you know, former student athletes is, you know, when we're a student athlete in college, like when you work out, it's not working out for your physical health in a sense. You working out because like for football players, I played, I played center for all four years in college. Mm -hmm. I was training to be durable, as strong as I possibly could be. And to be able to put another grown man that was my size or bigger on their ass, excuse my language, but that's what I lifted weights for. That's why, you know, when I walked in the weight room, I could squat almost 600 pounds. I could bench press 365. I could power clean well over 300 pounds. It's because my sole purpose was to be as strong as I possibly could be to do my job at the best ability I could. And so, you know, weightlifting had purpose in a sense like there was a purpose behind I mean literally lifting for two and three hours a day you know going to the gym seven days a week things like that there was a there was a purpose behind it like I had there was a, a end objective like okay I'm starting to do all this training four and five days a week throughout the summer mm -hmm. there's a reason for this like I'm looking forward to using this this muscle this strength this power mm -hmm. like <clears throat> there's a purpose behind it mm -hmm. and then when football was over <clears throat> I went to the gym I went and got a gym membership mm -hmm. and it was so weird. Like I never forget it. Like our season had ended Thanksgiving week, 2014. Mm -hmm. I took maybe two weeks off, you know, not a, not a long time, maybe a week and a half, mm -hmm. two weeks off and went to the gym and it has seemed like I had lost every piece of muscle in my body in that two weeks like and it was just like yo what happened like I've been lifting consistently heavy for at this point at least a good eight years wow but it wasn't the strength that had went away it was the purpose oh wow like what am I doing this for mm. like and, and I'll be honest with you, I, I, I've seen a lot of other scholar athletes talking about it. You know, it's one thing when you got to get up at 5 a.m. and go to the gym mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. you know, run around and, you know, do drills and lift weights and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it's fun in a sense because, you know, I mean, you're young. It's fun. Mm -hmm. you know, it's fun to work out and be strong and be physically fit. Mm -hmm. But there was always an agenda behind it. Like I said, there was always a purpose. There was always, it had to be done. It wasn't like you couldn't miss our workout. It wasn't like you could choose not to lift weights and you'd be fine for the football season. Right. You had to do this. Wow. And one of the things that I'm struggling with now, and you know, you know, as I shared on the show before, I have a newborn son coming any day now. Yeah. You know? And, you know, for me, I'm 28, but like I said, I'm already 300 pounds. And as we know, you know, people generally don't get smaller as they get older. Right. Your metabolism and everything else slows down. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'll be honest with you, you know, I've been telling myself literally my wife's entire pregnancy, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to get in <laughs> shape. I'm going to get in shape. Like, and I mean, finding 
you would think, well, the purpose is, you know, you got a son coming and it, and it sounds good. It really sounds good. But I'll be honest with you, like being a college athlete for four years and mm-hmm. being forced to work out. I mean, let's be real. Mm-hmm. It's not like you, it's voluntary. You're forced to work yeah. out and mm-hmm. rightfully so. But here I am as just a regular citizen nowadays. And it's like, I, I ain't got to do it. Like, you know, Never I'm just like, the I'm motivation. Just, I ain't got to work out. Like, is no, there's no coach that's going to make me, you know, run for an hour at four in the morning if I miss workouts. Like, if I miss a workout. And I say all that to say, and I think as men, especially, you know, former student athletes, and, and not every former student athlete is like that, of course, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, the easiest example is somebody like Shannon Sharp. Shannon Sharp is, I think, 53 years old. Mm-hmm. And he looks like he's 23, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. <laughs> but for somebody like him, you know, physical fitness has been something for him that he has cherished his entire life. Yeah. And there are a lot of other student athletes like that who, you know, they just cherish physical fitness beyond their sport. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's like some Michael like Irvin and Emmett Smith, you know, I can put, yeah, but absolutely. I mean, what they do, they, they look really, really, really good for their age. And, and then, okay, I'll go ahead and give props. I mean, Tom Brady looks good for his age. He, he, I mean, Playing at a, I mean, he really, won a Super Bowl at forty-two really years old. Really, looks really, really good. For, I mean, Greg forty-two is not old, but he looks amazing for his age, knowing that he's been playing football all these years. And granted, he don't get hit that much, but he gets hit, and you could see during the season that he was getting up slower and slower. But he looks like he is in amazing, amazing shape for his age. I- Absolutely. And I mean, and so I, I think the elephant in the room here that needs to be addressed is, and, and the word that we're really looking for is accountability. Yeah. And especially for men, you know, and, and <laughs> when we talk about black men and accountability, you know, we, we always think of, you know, well, black man's pride, especially, you know, older black man's pride. Like, you know, yeah. you, I tell me what to do. I go by the own beat of my drum. I know what's best for me. I don't need nobody telling me what to do. Right. And you know, that bravado, that machismo that's always been projected and we just sit there and think that's manly. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's fear-based projection. That mm-hmm. that fear of having to deal with something that you can't control. I mean, let's be, like I said, on my dad's side of the family, diabetes runs rampant. He lost both his parents to diabetes. He's diabetic. And for, you know, ever since he's been diagnosed with diabetes, I think almost 20 years now, he has made a conceited effort to do everything in his power to not let it take his life. Yeah. And that's not been easy. And, you know, and it's funny because I see what he has to do just to maintain mm-hmm. a healthy lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And then I see other people who are diabetic. And I mean, it's like they just sabotage, like they, they indulge. They indulge on the very Sugar thing that is and killing cream. them. Yep. Mm-hmm. And Eating pasta and ice cream and cakes and cookies and pies and soda and you name it, they're putting it in their body. And and I think and I and I think the one thing that we do not talk about, not only as mental health professionals, but it just as people as general, is you know when we sit there and think about you know substances and stuff like that, you know we always sit there and say, alcohol and cigarettes are the most addictive substances and the hardest to quit. Well, let me one up you on that one. <laughs> I think the hardest substance to quit is food because you just can't quit food. Period. Ever. Right. Right. You have to have some degree of nourishment going into your body even if it's in liquid form, you have to eat or you'll die. Absolutely. And like I said, I've been obese my entire life. I've heard every story in the world. I've made up every excuse in the world to justify my eating habits. And, and I'll be honest with you. And, you know, me and my wife have had this conversation numerous times. Like, you know, oftentimes I can find an excuse in a heartbeat to justify why I'll eat three or 4,000 calories in a day. Like, you know, And, you know, for me, that's something I've battled with my entire life. You know, after I finished playing football, because I had that mindset of I had no purpose of working out anymore, I put on a hundred pounds. And, you know, and I'll tell you this, and, you know, I don't want to go too far left into this because I don't want to, you know, this is a very touchy subject for people, but I will say this. I will not believe anybody who is extremely overweight or morbidly obese and listen to them and sit there and say they're comfortable with how they feel. Wow. There is no way in work. I have been almost 400. I was 380 pounds at my heaviest. Not one day was I ever comfortable. Not one day. Now I could put on a smile. 
I could definitely put on a poker face and, you know, go out in society and make it seem like, oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, you know, I'm 380 pounds, you know, it's all, mm. but I'm good, you know, I'm doing good. Yeah. Lying to everybody and myself. Wow. So when we talk about physical fitness and how it pertains to mental health, I think, you know, especially as Black men, you know, we are extremely susceptible to these diseases and these ailments that we don't have to be. And, and, and I get it. You know, we love our food. We love good food. You know, <laughs> what's the one thing we're known for? We're known for seasoning food. I just seen a video on Instagram yesterday. This lady had a five pound bag of sugar and three pans of yams and used that whole five pound bag in those three pans of yams. And I'm just like, just order the diabetes for me, please. Like, so. <laughs> two orders of diabetes together <laughs> oh my gosh so you know I, I say all that to say you know we have to be real as, as men and as people as a society because america is the most obese country in the world and it's not even mm -hmm. close so mm -hmm. not only as us as black men but us as a society as a whole we have to take priority of our physical health because we only get older and you know our bodies break down over time and if we're not you always hear the analogy think of it like a car you know, if you had a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, you're not going to go put 87 octane in it or no 5W20 right. oil in there to make right. it run. You're going to take care of it. That's right. Think of your think of your body as a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. Yeah. Now, why that sounds so easy, like I said, for somebody who's been obese their whole life or somebody who has had a negative body image about themselves their entire life, mm -hmm. they're not going to see themselves as a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. So they're going to continue to put that bad food in the system. They're going to continue to drink them sodas and them sugary drinks and the sugary snacks and stuff like that and emotional eat and binge eat because when they look at themselves, they have no self-worth. They don't love themselves. They, they, don't, they don't feel like they can muster that type of energy about themselves to actually feel that good. So we have to take ownership and accountability for our own lives and understand this, like, you know, nobody gets obese overnight. Right. Nobody does, but we right. also don't, like we also don't lose that weight overnight really either. So, you know, it's, it's a one day at a time thing mm -hmm. and you have to be able to see it through. So, you know, my challenge to everybody is to please start, whether it's walking, you know, mm -hmm. eating more fruits, eating more vegetables, something to try and take control of your physical health, because mm -hmm. like the great, Deion Sanders used to say, you look good, you feel good. You feel good, you play good. Mm -hmm. So um, that's my mental health tip of the week alongside Dr. Pitt's mental health tip of the week. So for those out there listening, please take care of your physical health yeah. because it is directly tied to your mental health. Indeed. Indeed. Hmm. Now, as far as um, our, our college news this week, <clears throat> um, <laughs> Yeah, if you're listening, you might want to be sitting down for this one because this is definitely a, a heavy topic. And once again, you know, like we talked about last week, there are certain things that are going to come up that we will one day have to address, whether it's to our children, right. um, me and Dr. Pitt's case, our, our mental health clients, or just people in general. These are, you know, I always like when people sit there and say there's just certain conversation you shouldn't have. And I'm just like, well, why? Right. You, know? you got to have them. They don't go away because you have to address the elephant in the room and not talking about stuff doesn't resolve it. It doesn't make it go away. You have to be willing to have the hard conversations. Absolutely. So what we have here is a 18 year old freshman football player by the name of, and I hope I say his name right. It's I see me men E2, 18 years old. Uh, African-American football player who was getting ready to start at Virginia Tech. Um, he was charged with second degree murder on June 2nd with the killing of Jerry Paul Smith. So the incident is that apparently Etu matched with um, Jerry on the dating app Tinder. And for those who are familiar with Tinder, Tinder is an app where you basically swipe left or swipe left or swipe right at whoever you like or whatnot. And if you match, you have a conversation, you can meet up or whatever the case may be. So E2 and this man, Jerry, who Jerry was under the name Angie on Tinder. So Jerry was portraying himself as a female named Andy on this dating app named Tinder. And so they matched up. They met up and 
Etude received oral sex from Angie. So several weeks later, actually more specifically on Memorial Day, they had met up again. And that's when Etude had discovered that Angie was not a female, he was a male. And as a result of that, Etude had physically assaulted this man until he was killed. Um, smashed his face in, stomped his face, mm. several teeth were missing, the whole nine yards. And so when I saw when I saw this on uh, social media several weeks ago, about two weeks ago, actually, mm. I, I can tell you that the reaction I've seen from pretty much the entire African-American community is that he's innocent. Mm. He's not guilty. He's justified. I get it. You know, the whole nine yards. And, and, you know, I, I, and I'll be honest with, you know, our listeners and stuff like that. If, if I were put in a situation, I can assure you my reaction would not be positive. Um, because like with anything, you know, God forbid, you know, you were pulled over by somebody impersonating a cop and, you know, they arrested you. And then, you know, God forbid they took you somewhere. Or um, several years ago, there was an African-American who was posing as an OBGYN doctor. And, you know, as a, if I was a female, I can only imagine how violated I would feel if a man was posing as an OBGYN doctor and had a whole clinic set up. So, you know, I can definitely understand from the male perspective how I would feel if I met up with somebody who was portraying themselves as a female and we engaged in sexual acts and then I discovered that this person is not a female. I can almost assure you my reaction would not be positive. But something else I thought about, and you know, you can chalk it up to my, my therapist brain or my mental health brain. And you know, in, in therapy, we have to be open-minded and objective. We just can't be tunnel vision and closed-minded about certain situations. You know, one of my thoughts was, well, I mean, how do we know that he wasn't aware of this after the first time? And something could have went left in conversation. No idea, do not know, and I'm not here to play judge, jury, execution, or none of thing, nothing like that. You know, the court system will handle this on their own. However, I will say this, and I think, you know, like we said last week, you know, with, you know, certain states passing these transgender bills, certain states taking these stances on the whole LGBTQIA plus community and what they're allowed to do and what not they're allowed to do, I will say this. I think posing as anybody that you're not you run the risk of unfavorable consequences happening. Because like with anything, if we, if we were dating somebody and we, they turned out to be completely different from who the person where we met, I would think that most people will probably say, no, I'm not gonna have a happy response to that. However, I do think, you know, <sighs> this is a very tricky situation because I, I wholeheartedly feel like, you know, if you're posing as a female, you know, be honest. I mean, it, I know that sounds simple, but just be honest if you're gonna do that. You know, especially if you're leading somebody on and you're portraying yourself to be something you're not. You really, really put yourself in a, 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 a risky situation that can be avoided and vice versa, you know, for, for the gentleman who committed this crime because, you know, from all intents and purposes, it looked like he might felt he was led astray, you know, what are your thoughts, Dr. Pitts? Because this is, like I said, this is very, it's going to be very controversial to see how this plays out, you know, in, you know, with the court system and stuff like that, because, you know, I've heard many people talk about before, like, you know, it's one thing to identify and be transgender. That's one thing that, you know, and people like, if you identify as a female and that's how you want to identify, cool. But if you're doing it undercover and you're doing it to lie or, you know, manipulate people or to mislead them, I mean, personally, I think that's wrong. If you're gonna mislead me and, and portray a fake identity, I wouldn't care if you were proposing as a female, a lawyer, doc, any type of posing that you're gonna do that's gonna harm me. No, nah, I, I can't get down with that. Um, so so what, what are your initial thoughts on this? I think there's culpability on both parts. Um, certainly uh, the gentleman who was posing as the female didn't deserve to die. Um, but the 
the young man who was receiving the services also didn't deserve to be fooled. Um, I think that anytime you have deception, there are there you run the risk, as you said, um, you run the risk of the consequences being grave. Um, uh, what came to mind for me as you were talking is, um, you know, black men on the down low, and how, you know, wives and girlfriends um, think that they're in a heterosexual relationship with someone that is not being forthcoming about their sexual preferences. And the result of it is that the woman contracts HIV or AIDS because of, the, you know, um, it's tragic. It's tragedy all the way around. And what I say is that, you know, your preferences are your preferences. I don't have a heaven or hell to put anybody in. Um, I actually uh, advocate quite strongly for humane treatment of the LGBTQ uh, IA plus community because I believe that all people have a right to be treated humanely regardless of who they are or what their preferences are. Um, I just think that there's culpability on both parts. I think that uh, the young man who's being charged with second degree murder you know, if he's got an attorney that's worth his weight in law, they're going to have a full comprehensive psych evaluation that gets done to determine psychologically um, what happened. Um, you know, and to your point, Ronnie, you know, if I were to find out that you know, I was in a, a, a committed relationship or, or any type of relationship, you know, um, mm -hmm. with someone. Actually, you know what? I, even though it wasn't something like that, you know, I've been in, um, and I'm being totally transparent right now, um, you know, was in a previous relationship where there was an exorbitant amount of deception that, you um, took me to a headspace where I was homicidal for six months. Like I literally, like I'm so serious. I was so mentally unstable for six months because I just could not conceive how someone that professed to love me and care about me could deceive me to the degree that I was deceived. It, I, I, like I was, my cheese had officially come off my cracker mm -hmm. and I went through a period of six months where I <laughs> did you not like family members and friends were babysitting me because they were afraid I was going to kill him. I'm total transparency. They were afraid. Yeah, I, was I mean, nobody, like I said, nobody wants to be fooled. And I mean, yeah. you know, and I think I always see, I always see, you know, the younger generation say, you know, don't love me, just be loyal to me. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, when we, and I think people's, especially in nowadays where, you know, we look for privacy, we look for security, we look for safety in so many mm -hmm. ways other than ourselves. Mm -hmm. When we are vulnerable with people, you mm -hmm. know, we're vulnerable with somebody and we're allowed to be ourselves in front of somebody mm -hmm. and they deceit you or they break that trust. I mean, yeah. that that's, that's oftentimes that's hard for anybody to recover from. Yeah. And, you know, so I think in, in this specific situation right here, this case study of one that we have here, mm -hmm. you know, if, if it comes out that this gentleman, you know, like we said, nobody deserves to lose their life for, you know, any any reason, you know, mm -hmm. we don't play God on, we don't play God as humans, we, you know, we're not, we're not meant to determine somebody's life or death. However, you know, if it does come out that this man was deceitful and, and misleading, you know, this young gentleman, this young student athlete, like I said, you know, if that was me, if I was 18 and I had just been discovered, I was, you know, misled like that. You know, like I said, I I don't know what my react. It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a positive reaction. Yeah. I would definitely be pissed off. I can tell you that much. I would be highly pissed off. 
Um, and, and I don't think that's right. I, I think there should, and I think that's when, you know, when we talk about us as mental health professionals, you know, I think one of our jobs is to be able to be able to, what's the word I'm looking for, be resourceful in how we address these things because these situations do come up and these type of situations oh, come okay. up in mental health all the time. So, you know, it, it's one thing when the pop, you know, when society hears about situations like this, but in the mental health field, we hear about this all the time because, you know, one of the things, a, a very common diagnosis that can be attributed to this is, you know, uh, DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder, where mm -hmm. because you might have suffered from a traumatic event or something happens, mm -hmm. because you can't deal with that trauma, you portray yourself as a completely different personality to protect mm -hmm. yourself. So when we hear stories like this in the mental health field, these are things that, you know, are not necessarily uncommon. However, you know, when we talk about it's one thing to identify a different personality. It's a whole other thing to identify as a completely different gender, but, right. but it's not because that's how you solely identify. If you're doing it for the purpose of misleading people and things like that, I also think that's an unfair crime to those who are trying to really uh, transition and identify as the mm -hmm. opposite sex. So, yeah. you know, it's definitely a, a hard thing to swallow for people who, you know, are, are actually trying to do this and those who are doing this to be deceitful and hurt people. Yeah, just, yeah. just one final thought before we move on real, real quick. Um, one of the things that I think that is so um, relevant here is that people have to be willing to take responsibility and accountability for what happens when you take a person's power away. So yeah. what I mean by that is you take my power <clears throat> away for choice. And one of the things that I had said in the situation that I was in is that you made the assumption that I wouldn't be able to properly handle your truth. So you <clears throat> took my choices away from me and then it presented in a way that was so traumatic, so devastating um, because of what happened, but the greater devastation was you took my choices away from me. You stripped me of my power, which left me vulnerable in a way that caused me extraordinary psychological harm. Yeah. And when you look at... <clears throat> Look at the stigma in our communities, or really, period, when it comes to the LGBTQIA plus community, and that, yes, the great strides have been made, but there's still a stigma that's associated. So to your point, if, if this young man knew, that's a whole nother thing that yeah. you know, that look that'll come out in a psyche veil mm -hmm. um if he didn't know that'll come out in a psyche veil but what's what's relevant is that you don't have a right to strip me of my power yeah. tell me the truth and let me decide if i want to deal with whatever the truth is but don't trick me into believing and a, a false truth don't don't do that um because there is no guarantee how I might react to that. Absolutely. So let's move on. Um, we got a wealth <clears> of <throat> stuff to, to cover. And uh, Absolutely. So ooh. like we, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a heavy morning. Definitely yeah, been a heavy yeah. morning. Yeah. So like we said, our topic for today is, is time management is critical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we're talking about time management for student athletes, um, and my current student athletes and former student athletes who are listening can definitely understand this when I say this, you know, I will say that when you're a, a college student athlete, your time management is pretty much already done for you by the time you step foot on campus. And, and, and what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, you know, typically for the next four to five years, your life is structured in a way where by after your first semester, you kind of have a good idea of where you need to be, what time and how long you're going to be there. And, you know, like I've, I've shared many times before in the show, you know, <clears throat> one of, you know, our, our daily schedule for us during the season was get up 5, 5, 15, have meetings at 6, meetings last from 6 to 7, mm -hmm. you go weight lift from 7 to 8. If you had an 8 a.m. class and you go to class, then typically you're in class from 9 to 2, um, get a little bit of time for lunch, 
then from basically 2.30 to 6.30, you're at the football complex. You know, you're watching film, uh, treatment, things like that. And then you have practice. And then after that, you have study hall from 7 to 9. And then from 9 to whenever you go to sleep, that's your time. And that's typically how, if you play football, that's typically how it goes for you for four to five years of your college life. Now, I think where time management becomes extremely crucial for the student athlete, especially those who play football, is when we talk about, so how do we manage the time that we are given for ourselves? Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and for me personally, I was, once again, guilty of a lot of things here. You know, I'm a work in progress, mm -hmm. you know? God ain't through with me yet. I was when Steve Harvey said, don't trip. God ain't through with me yet. That's where mm -hmm. he, is. he ain't tripped yet. So, mm -hmm. you know, so for me, time management was always something that I, I mean, even to this day, I, I struggle with a little bit because, you know, chaos is kind of like a, a good time management skill for me in a sense where it's like, you know, if things are kind of scattered around and stuff like that. Just how my brain is, it's mm -hmm. organized, if that makes sense. Okay. But, You're organized but, you know, chaos, Ronnie. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Now, what I will say is also, and something that, uh, you know, through reflection and things like that, what I've also learned about myself is, is that oftentimes a lot of my struggles with time management I have often been times tied to my ADHD and my anxiety. Mm. And so what do I mean by that is, you know, typically one of the one of the biggest traits of ADHD is procrastination. Mm -hmm. And I have a PhD in procrastination. You know, <laughs> I can procrastinate any. I can't tell you how many times I've waited to literally the day before or the day of to knock out a 10, 15 page paper. We'll get an A, though, by the way, because, you know, what what better time to do work than crunch time when you do your best work so you know, <laughs> now i'm not telling anybody to follow that that is i would not that is not the that. recipe for success you're giving today not at all <laughs> no it, it's a recipe for burnout though it is it is same. it is a recipe for burnout and you will burn out very fast so i do not recommend that however what i am saying is is that oftentimes you know we, we kind of overlook things that kind of hinder, you know, us being productive with time management. And one of those things can be ADHD and anxiety. And what we do know is for most, you know, uh, young males between the, age, eight, between the age of 18 and 22, ADHD runs rampant, especially at that age, you know, especially for, you know, student athletes. ADHD is one of the number one diagnoses of college students and of student athletes is because, the perception is we have a hard time focusing, we have a hard time staying on task, you know, so those things kind of tie into that and procrastination is one of the biggest ones is, you know, where we'll put off stuff into the last minute. And typically when you think of a student athlete putting off stuff to the last minute, it's probably because we're either tired or, mm -hmm. you know, we're trying to get other things done that have nothing to do with being a student athlete. So mm -hmm. I, I do think that, you know, time management is a skill that has to be practiced. Time management is something that has to be, you know, a conceited effort by the individual to, to do. Um, but we're definitely going to talk about some of the things and how we can improve on time management because those who are able to master their time, mm -hmm. master their future, I believe. That's right. You know, if, if you can, one of the things that I say, you know, if I'm doing an inspirational speaking engagement is I can tell sort of the trajectory of your life based on what your daily routine is. If, if, I'm, if I'm talking to you, and I do this with my clients, if, if you share with me what your daily routine is and I can have an opportunity to view you in your natural element among your closest network of friends or family members, your circle of influence, mm -hmm. I can pretty much project what your future is going to look like based on the company you keep and what you do with your time from day to day, because it's how you manage your time is habit for me. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, and it becomes these routines. And you also said something important that I want our viewing and listening audience to be aware of concerning ADHD. Children of color, particularly boys of color are disproportionately diagnosed with ADHD. Absolutely. So, so oftentimes, and we've mentioned it on previous shows, you know, in reality, it could be PTSD, but there are definitely some symptoms of um, ADHD that mirror the symptomology of PTSD. So now you have this whole cohort, if you will, 
of student athletes that are engaged in sports from, you know, the age of five up until college or, or on into the league that have these ADHD diagnoses. And I think that not only is the onus on the parents um, for the child up until they get to an age where they can manage the ADHD on their own, but then when you get to that point, but I think that it's also one of those spaces where coaches need to be aware that a scholar athlete has an ADHD or any mental health diagnosis so that they can appropriately help them to put you know, systems and measures in place to effectively manage their time. But Ronnie, to manage their mind. Yeah. It's that whole, it's what we talked about last week, right? It's this holistic approach to performance that is imperative for coaches and trainers and every member of that athletic department to be consciously aware of in order to serve these scholar athletes well and to truly set them up for success. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And, and, and you made a great point as far as like coaches being aware of that. And, and I kind of, you know, and I, th I think one of the way, like I said, I think one of the ways coaches try to keep student athletes busy is by just, I mean, filling their schedule up with as much things as possible so they don't have idle time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we talk about this all the time, when we, especially for freshman student athletes. And, and, you know, they, freshman student athletes, you can kind of tell what that student athlete is going to be like, you know, within that first semester. Because, mm -hmm. like I said, you know, when we think of, you know, the, the stereotypical student athlete, we think of, you know, the all American jock, we think of that person, you know, going to college campus and things like that. And, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times, like I said, I've heard where, you know, at the division one level, you know, the perception is like, well, when I go division one, I don't necessarily have to go to class. My work is going to be yeah. done for me. I might go see a tutor here, a tutor there, but for the most part, I'm here to play football. Yeah. And, and even that, even having that type of mindset of, you know, just filling a young kid's mind up with things to do because they is, is one thing that they want to do. I think other part of, you know, a lot of student athletes time management struggle is because, like I said, you know, why it sounds good on paper, the often time is like, you know, as a student athlete, we also got there, you know, halfway through the season. It's like, damn, I would love some time to myself. I, I would love mm -hmm. to just, you know, just plug away from, you know, being a student athlete for one day. But oftentimes we don't get that. And, you know, for us, our off day was Monday. But on Monday, you still got class. On, on Monday, you still got community service to do. On Monday, you still got study hall to do. So even though it's an off day from practice, it's not necessarily an off day from, you know, just being a student athlete. So you feel like you got to do all these things at one time. So you, you discard priorities. You discard being a student that day. You're like, oh, it's Monday. It's an off day. We ain't got no tests or nothing. So I'm just not, I'm not even going to go to class. I can miss three classes for the semester. I'm good. And, and like you said, Anything that you do consistently is habit forming. So when you when you put stuff off, when you dismiss priorities over a course mm -hmm. of a time repeatedly, it becomes habit. And then also on top of that, you also convince your mind to give you scapegoats. Give your you know you give your mind a chance to you know scapegoat your accountabilities. And and we see this especially in the first semester for a lot of student athletes is when you come back after winter break and you got a 1.0 or a 0.5, or, you know, you got all Fs on your, your first, you know, your first uh, transcript. And it's like, yo, now you're at risk of being put, kicked out of the university and also okay. losing your athletic scholarship because you struggled severely with time management. Ronnie, you touched on something else that is, that is really pertinent that I sort of want to take a minute to, to flesh out and, and to really clarify for our listeners. So as you were describing what the day and a week looks like for a, a scholar athlete. On one hand, if you, you could ideally look at the glass half full in that. So let's do that for a moment. So looking mm -hmm. at the glass half full, it says that what you're teaching this scholar athlete is how to um, effectively manage their time, how to successfully multitask, how to stay focused and driven and tenacious in getting all of the things accomplished that they need accomplished. But as we know, in this universe that we live in, there's also the law of opposites that are in effect here. And I think the polar opposite of what you described speaks to what we call clinically as this reinforcement of maladaptive behaviors, right? So yes. the, the other part of that that cannot be dismissed is that 
we are also sending this message that creates this internal narrative that self-care is not important, that mm -hmm. work, 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 work. And then we wonder why folks are depressed out of their mind when they can't play anymore because now I have all this free time. What do I do with all this free time? Mm -hmm. what, what, what do I do with you know life after football, life after basketball or baseball or whatever the case may be? Because I, for the past four or five years, if you're redshirted, I've spent all of this time literally <laughs> having the bulk of my 24 hours in a day dictated to me on what I'm going to do. And it's, it's, it's comparable to folk that are in the military to come out of the military, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, wait, ah, what do I do? You know, I, I talk to, you know, folk that have been in the military and folks that, like you said, that are on that athletic routine. And it's like, yo, why are you up at five o'clock in the morning? Because I had to get up and do PT because I had to get up and do that, you know? So it, what you described really does describe in greatly just how easily the human mind is manipulated. I tell people all the time, the human mind is a pump. It'll do whatever you tell it to do. It is yep. extremely, no, for real. It's extremely obedient. It Absolutely. is, people don't, and I say, like, I say this to my clients all the time. The people do not realize that the human mind is very easily manipulated and it will do whatever you tell it to do whenever you tell it to do it. The human mind is extremely, extremely obedient. So when you factor that into time management, you know, if you're telling yourself, and, and how many people have said this, you know, I, I wish there were more than 24 hours in a day. But here's the thing, once time is lost, you cannot get it back. So it is extremely important to first and foremost to recognize that you suck at time management. The first yeah. step to recovery is admitting that you have a problem. You cannot conquer and resolve something that you're not even willing to confront. So I think that that's one of the key things that our scholar athletes and our parents and coaches and athletes and everybody else needs to know that there has to be this balance, right? There has to be this balance where, you know, the narrative is, yeah, you're going to do this work to be the best that you can be and to heighten your performance. But the flip side of that is you also have to be willing to take care of yourself. You also have to be willing to have this holistic approach to your wellness. And what I, and I know we haven't gotten into tips yet, but just, you know, one real quick. One of the things that I tell my clients or, or recommend to my clients to do is to actually schedule your self-care time. Mm -hmm. Just like you have mm -hmm. allocated time to go to practice, allocated time to watch films, to weight lift, to try, whatever it is, allocate your self-care time. You have to do that. You have to make time for yourself. It's, it's like, you know, for those of you that, that are, are tithers, you know, you get paid, you tithe 10% of your income to, to wherever your, your church membership is, you pay yourself, and then you pay your bills. Well, the same thing applies to effective time management. Yes, you have a responsibility to allocate your time to X, Y, and Z responsibilities, but there also has to be allocated time for you and for your self-care on purpose. Absolutely. And, and I think, I think, <clears throat> and I wanted you to also kind of, you know, touch on this a little bit too, because I think these other two things are just as important and how they can impact time management mm -hmm. is we talked about a little bit how ADHD can um, severely impact time management, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but also, you know, general anxiety and also even depression. Yeah. Um, okay. And you know why, and, and while we both agree that we think that ADHD is severely disproportionately um, diagnosed, you know, especially in the African American community, because you know we've said on many, you know numerous occasions where we feel like it's often diagnosed because people just don't have the patience to deal with the mm -hmm. just kids being kids. Mm -hmm. So we, we see that happen, but also just even with anxiety that's diagnosed and undiagnosed, oftentimes people, when people when we think of anxiety, especially in the you know the uh, sports realm. Anxiety is an excuse to have poor performance or an excuse yeah. so you don't sit there and say, well, no, nah, you just suck. You didn't do good on this play. It's your anxiety. Mm -hmm. But I'm not necessarily talking about anxiety on the playing field or the, or the court or anything. I'm talking about anxiety as far as time management on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, just as much as procrastination is a direct, uh, you know, correlation to ADHD, it's also a direct correlation to anxiety and depression. And, and what do I mean by that? You know, if you have a student athlete who struggles with any type of anxiety, we'll just use general anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. for right now. So mm -hmm. if you have a student athlete who is generally anxious about, you know, their performance or about, you know, getting reinsurance or getting reaffirmed that they're doing the right thing, oftentimes you'll have student athletes who sabotage yep. in, in the form of procrastination. Mm -hmm. Because of the, the thought of starting and messing up, the start, the thought of you know failing this class and and losing my scholarship and getting kicked out of school and then having to do this on my own, you know mm -hmm. those irrational thoughts that start to manifest quickly in our minds just because of the the thought of not succeeding at a task, especially for freshman student, you know, yeah. you know oftentimes you know not for everybody, but when you have that transition from high school to college, there is a there is a greater demand of your time and, and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, especially for student athletes, because like I said, you know, freshman year is a, is a trend. And now I will say this, and I think, you know, for division one student athletes, that transition might be a little bit easier because, you know, you're doing summer school on top of summer workouts. So you're kind of getting an idea of what that schedule is like mm -hmm. when you're in the middle of the season. And, and I always tell people this, you know, when you're a student athlete, there's a reason you're a student first. As much as professors and things like that can understand that you're a student athlete and they see you rocking the, the track suit and the, the sweatpants and all that type of stuff, what sports you play, they don't really care that you play that sport. <laughs> and they're not getting a bonus by having you in their class. They, right. they have a job right. to do. So I always tell student athletes, just because you're a student athlete, don't think that you're just going to automatically get that A or that teacher's right. going to understand why you're so tired or right. why you miss class. Oftentimes they don't care, you know? So when you're in the middle of the season and, you know, let's say for example, your major is engineering or something like that, like, you know, not an easy major. Mm -hmm. And you're over here worried about your midterms and your finals and things like that on top of transitioning to being a, a college student athlete, getting used to the workout schedule, getting used to the class schedule and the practice schedule mm -hmm. and all these things, all these new transitions, your sensory system kind of gets overwhelmed and you get anxious about, well, what if I fail at mm -hmm. this and I'm gonna fail at that and this and that and this, and it just builds up and mounts and your anxiety will cause you to sabotage and not do it at all. So you are you lock up at the thought of starting that you never start. And then that tra that chain effect of everything that comes after that, in a kind of a sense, what you feared, you manifested because you feared it mm -hmm. because of that general anxiety. So it, it's funny that you talk about that, Ronnie, because, you know, we'll, we'll call it the law of attraction. So when I think about the athletes that um, that I'm currently working with in my practice, as well as parents of athletes that I'm currently working with in my practice, um, one of the, the first things that I do is I give them what I call the layman the layman's uh, definition of anxiety and depression. And the layman's definition of anxiety is ruminating, as you do vocabulary reference, ruminating on stuff that you have no control of, ruminating about the, the what ifs. And then with depression, I tell folks it's, it's spending time, far too much time obsessing over the wrong things. And it's the same thing with the anxiety. It's you're, you're taking all of this precious time ruminating about the what ifs. So what I say, because you know I'm a hot stir, <laughs> what I say to folks is, okay, what if you have a big game? What about, do, do you know of anybody that has lost their scholarship because they had one bad game? I don't. I mean, I, I mean, maybe there is someplace somewhere in the world, but as, as a norm, you, you're not going to lose your starting spot or your athletic scholarship because of one get bad game. But here's the narrative that's been coming forth with this, Ronnie, that is just, it speaks to so many shows that we've done already. Well, I would be a disappointment to my parents. Mm. I, I have been there before. Mm -hmm. I, I can honestly, I can honestly say I've been there before. And and because and, and for me, like putting that pressure on myself to take advantage of the investments my parents made, 
I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it, I gave myself anxiety. I just put an immense amount of pressure on myself to mm-hmm. not fail. But this is what well, I that's how, Well, that's how I, that's how I, that's how I internalized it at the time. And now I see it's definitely anxiety. This is where, this is where I frustrate parents. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> I say to my, my, my scholar athlete clients, so have your parents ever been disappointed before? Well, yeah. Have have they been disappointed more than once? Yeah. Have they been disappointed more than 10 times? Yeah. So is it fair to say that there are other things in life that disappoint them? Yeah. Why are you making yourself crazy? Because they're disappointed. Isn't that a part of life? So what I do is I challenge that cognitive distortion that suggests that somehow having a bad game or getting a bad grade is going to be so devastating to these parents that they're just not going to ever function properly. Stop it. It's like you, and and oh, by the way, it goes back to something we've said in other shows too. It's now, here's here's the, uh, another deep issue with this. Now you're spending so much time creating a depressed and an anxious mind that you self-sabotage but oh by the way you're also getting over into this mental health issue of validating yourself by your athletic performance and now you have self-esteem issues you know why you have self-esteem issues you know why you have anxiety you know why you have depression because you think that because you're a scholar athlete, it's not okay for you to be fallible and imperfect like all the rest of us on the universe, in the universe. And I and I like I gut punch with that because it's like, oh, so you're perfect. No, Dr. Pitts, I didn't say that. Well, no, you did. You did. Mm-hmm. Because you just shared with me that not being perfect, I'm paraphrasing. You you my interpretation, you said. Dr. Pitts, I get really anxious, I get depressed if I have a big game or whatever. My interpretation of what you said is, I demonstrated in this game, in this meet or or whatever, that I am fallible and I am imperfect and I can't handle being fallible and imperfect like everybody else on the face of the planet. And now I'm getting over into mental illness because of it, because of a sport that I am not going to play for the rest of my life, Mm -hmm. I now have developed mental illness because of it. Are you kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? As you said that, man, saying that took me to a place because I was over here thinking like, when we're like, I think when we're student athletes, I, I think, because of, like I said, you know, playing a college sport is a, it's a business. You know, it's a whether you're Division One, Two, or Three, it's a business mm-hmm. because you know lots of money is being transferred and, and people are making investments in you. And I think you know, to your point, not only you know do some student athletes feel that pressure from you know the family of you know when, when we're talking about kids who might play at a high level and you know like well you're supposed to be the one to get us out of the hood or you're supposed to be the one who's supposed to uplift the family. And even, you know, you have the other kids on the other side where it's like, you know, well, we don't invested all this money in you to go to camps and, you know, we don't, we don't took you to all these prep courses and stuff like that. We put you in private school. We gave you the best trainers and coaches and things like that, you know, don't squander this. And on top of that, even just as being a student athlete period, you know, one of the constant things you always hear when it's in practice is, you know, perfect, you know, practice and what is it perfect practice makes perfect or whatever bs coaches used to say and you know it's like practice makes perfect performance and that's not true yeah and and so you and even and i mean even like it to your point like when you have a student athlete come to you that you know they, they have anxiety over a big game i think we internalize it as like you know these life or death ultimatums is because that's how it you know let's be real that's how it's presented and that's how it's projected because 
like I said, you know, when, when you play that sport and you have dedicated that much time, I think that's what anything we do as, as humans. Like if we, if we really invest our time into something that we're extremely passionate about, mm -hmm. or, you know, we're extremely, I saw, for example, um, in the news, this Florida man was like 94 years old, had worked at this plant for like 37 years. Mm -hmm. New management came in, fired him on day one. He went back and shot and killed him. See, he, and, they and took he, that. They took that man's life away, and you know it's yeah. like. And I think so. When we, to your point, when we when we sit there and look at the student athlete who develops this anxiety and depression mm -hmm. over the fear of failure in their performance and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, I look at it, you know, because like I said, one of the one of the things my coach used to always say. And I get it because in their mind, they're trying to spark inspiration. They're trying to spark motivation mm -hmm. but when it comes off as, you know, look, I'm a, I, each year when I go recruit, I don't care if you was all American the year before or whatnot, I'm looking to replace you. Yeah. So it's like, I think one of the things that kind of happens in sports is, you know, and I think what you're also getting at is it's hard to appreciate the moment because in sports, what do we hear all the time, especially like when you win it, when you win so much. Mm -hmm. it's on to the next thing it's on to the next thing like we won we're going to celebrate for maybe 24 hours and then we're moving on because as yeah. much as this win means something it's really not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things because we got to go out here and win the very next week mm -hmm. so even even your accomplishments are kind mm -hmm. of not dismissed but they're diminished they are it's like, it's like who who so you graduated from college in 2015 in 2015 who got player of the year in 2011 for the ciwa conference mm -hmm. hell if i know what, what about 2012 Ooh, 2012 oh god um i want to say it was somebody from winston-salem but i couldn't even be honest i couldn't tell you who who won the um the award for most offensive tackles last year don't even know who who led the league last year for sex ooh um oh god oh was it the boy from the buccaneers i want to say it was the boy i want to say it was the dude from but it was somebody that's a good, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you. So the moral to the story is you go out on the field or the court or the baseball diamond every single solitary game with the intention of putting forth your absolute best performance. Mm -hmm. You do that. That's your mindset. I, I respect it, I value and, and, and appreciate that. The issue that I have with that is when life impacts you in the moment mm -hmm. and you don't have your best game, for example, and now you're in this low depressive place or in this, you're throwing up before the next game because you got to do better, you got to do better, you got to do better, you got to do better. You're making yourself sick trying to do better which in essence is self-sabotaging your ability to do better yeah and, I'm and, saying, I, and i definitely think in that instance yeah, yeah what, it, I'm, it, what i'm saying to players is put forth your best effort every single solitary time you enter into competition but also give yourself space to be human and not a superhero because one thing that we know to be sure and certain, even champions lose sometimes. Oh, if you yeah. don't believe me, just look at quotes by Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson and 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 even you know celebrities Ali, like Ali, like and Tyler Perry and Steve Mark. You know, you it's the the list is endless of people, an endless list of people who have done extraordinary things. And here is my challenge. Here is my call to action. Use the adversities of those occasions when you didn't play as your best. Use them as teachable moments or growth moments. Flip it. Do not 
beat yourself up and develop this internal negative narrative that leads to depression and anxiety and substance use and abuse and all of these other things. Use it as a stepping stone to get better because mm -hmm. there are times that, as we know from the Super Bowl and the NBA championship and folk being eliminated and everything else, and games that you all have played at the middle school, high school, collegiate level, and the professional level, there's only one winner. Yeah. There's only one winner. Y'all get mad when games end in a tie. Y'all mad. <laughs> Folk got mad when the NFL changed that rule. What I, you mean? I, 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 still don't under, I, I still don't understand how the NFL at this Yeah. Like, Folk got feeling. a tie. Like, there is no tie. No, there no. is no tie in the game. Somebody it's, has there's to be one winner and one loser. And what I, I say this, and I put it in the, the context of fighting, right? There's always somebody can tap that. There's always somebody that's stronger, faster, better, bigger. Always. Be your best. And your best is going to contribute to your ability to stay sane and healthy mentally if you allow your best to be good enough. And you said it. That 24-hour rule, Ronnie, win, lose, or draw, bask in it, dwell in it, pity party in it for 24 hours, and then move the heck on. Yeah. Move on. Stop wasting time. Stop waking, wasting precious, valuable time talking about the shoulda, coulda, woulda. And, and oh, if I may. I want to want to hit this on a positive note too, w through a positive lens. So, to this to the athlete that hasn't broken a record or won a championship or done anything extraordinary in their sport, you know, in the past two seasons, stop talking about all the sacks that you got freshman year. Uh, boo was junior year. Uh, stop I dwelling. Stop dwelling in the past about how great you are and 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 tighten up your game and yeah. do what you need to do, but do it in a way that's not going to make you mentally ill. Use your time more effectively to bring your A game every single solitary time, mm -hmm. but bringing one's A game shouldn't result in being sick. No, I, I definitely agree with that. And, and I think that speaks to even, the, you know, to your point, that speaks on the larger picture of, you know, when we talk about student athletes and developing, like you said, developing this performance based sports identity yeah. of your identity is who you are as the athlete, as opposed to just understanding that that's, that's just one of the titles you carry. Mm -hmm. Who you are as a person is not defined by one sport or one event or one job or one career. That's just part of who you are. But I think with sports so easy, because I mean, you know, when I think about it, you know, sports are the one thing that everybody does as a child, but only a select few get paid. I mean, buku amounts of money right. to play a child's game. Right. And, and like I said, it's kind of like it's a physical lottery, you know. Yeah. Where you have one and a quarter million high school football players or senior football players will make it to the NFL. Mm -hmm. That's a large odds, but we so many guys put themselves in that position like, well, it can be me. It can be me. It can be me. And as years go on and you realize it ain't going to be me. It ain't going to be me. We right. sit there and we we overgeneralize things as oh, well, I wasn't good at this, so I guess I'm not going to be good at that the rest of my life or not be good at this the rest of our life. Right. And, and, and we place meaning on things that might not have any meaning in our lives, period. Right. You know, right. not every, like I said, not everybody is destined to go to the NFL or the NBA or MLB. Right. That's just not your destiny. But that does not mean the thing that you did or the, the, the things you did for that sport at that time doesn't have any value. There's no lessons in that. And I right. think that's really important for people to understand is, you know, what we do, like we do everything for a certain amount of time, you know, and we take the lessons, we take the good and the bad from that. And we learn from it and try and, you know, see how that can better our lives moving forward. So for those of you who, I mean, of course, take your sport seriously. I mean, if you, if you're playing at a college level, take it seriously. You, you know, you didn't just get to play college football or college basketball by not taking it seriously, by not 
having any type of vested interest in it. So if you're going to put your interest and your time into it, of course, do your best. But also, and I think, you know, and I think the benefit of me and you doing this work, Dr. Piss, is like, we can reach these kids at an early enough age where it's like, yeah. look, yeah. as much as you want to invest your life into this sport, that's fine. But you have to look at the bigger picture because it's always bigger than you. Yeah. It will yeah. always be bigger than you. Um, and I think we have to start developing, especially, and I was going to ask you this, you know, um, real quick before we move into our tips. Um for you being the parent of a student athlete, um, being the parent of a high school student athlete and things like that, where, you know, one of the things we know this is, you know, typically boys, especially in high school, time management is not our forte. So what would you say to the parent of a high school student athlete who, you know, whether or not they might think their kid has a talent in student, ath in student athletics or whatever the case may be, uh -huh. what do you say to the parent who is trying to help establish time management within their child um, to help take their sport seriously or to, you know, look, if this is what you want to do, well, you have, part of it is time management. You have to be able to manage your time mm -hmm. to study and things like that, because the high school structure is a whole lot different than the college structure, right. as far as, you know, the flexibility and things like that. Right. Uh, well, the first thing, Ronnie, is parents need to master time management themselves. <laughs> oh, look, let's go ahead and call that what it is. Very true. Very um, true. Parents need to, you know, apply the tips that we're getting ready to share in a moment as well um so that they're managing their own time effectively and then it needs to be a mandate um you know i wasn't um andre to my knowledge has never referred to me as strict um but i was firm mm -hmm. and there were he understood that there were things that were just non-negotiables in our home and mediocre academic performance was just not tolerated um, because he was capable of being exceptional academically. That was the standard of excellence that was placed upon him. So he was conditioned to be academically disciplined. He was conditioned to effectively manage his time. And it wasn't me doing that through a helicopter approach to parenting. It was me doing that, Ronnie, through role modeling effective time management. So mm -hmm. you have to remember, you know, I was in single parent mode and I worked full time. I went to school full time. I was a full time single parent. So I didn't miss games. I didn't miss practices. And he was able to bear witness firsthand to how I prioritized our lives as a family unit. And as a result, that served as an appropriate example for him on how to prioritize um, his time. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing is parents have to master time management in order to be able to, per, to, per, to appropriately serve as um, a role model and example for their children. And then, you know, we're getting ready to get into the other tips and certainly I'll share them as well. Yeah, and I think that I think those are modeling what we always talk about parents being able to do it because it's one thing to point at your kid and tell them, well, you need to do this and that. And then you're not, you're doing the complete opposite of that. I, I wholeheartedly agree. So, <clears throat> all right, fellas. I mean, well, all right, listeners. So we have, you know, a couple minutes here and we wanted to share some practical time management skills that, you know, can help aid in your ability to learn how to not only time manage because. I think, you know, the point me and Dr. Pitts made earlier in the show is like, you know, when you're a student athlete, and I said this, you know, your life is basically scripted for you for four or five years. And so there's really not much thought being put into what you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis because it's kind of streamlined for you. Yep. But I will tell you this, and I'm firsthand, I'm a firsthand survivor of this, is uh, being put in a situation where somebody has made your schedule for you for so long when it's time for you to actually plan, because even if you really think about it, going all the way back to just even public school from kindergarten through 12th grade and then college, that's mm -hmm. a good 16 years of your life being mapped out on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you mm -hmm. become a full-time adult and now you have to map out your morning, your day, your evening and your nighttime, if you've never done that before, I've never had to do it, it can be a scary transition. And oftentimes, you know, that's where you start to see the procrastination, the sabotaging, the depression and things like that, because that overwhelming feeling of 
oh Lord, now I'm responsible for my day-to-day schedule. Right. What am I gonna do? So I will share some things that have worked that have worked well for me. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the biggest things that have worked well for me is is writing things down. Mm-hmm. Writing things down is super important. And, and the reason I say that is, is because oftentimes when we leave stuff up to our brain to make a calendar in our brain, like we said, our brain can be our best friend or our worst enemy. Oftentimes when we have a lot of things that require our time and attention and effort, and we feel like we have so many of them stacked up, we give ourselves anxiety or you know jitters of like, oh, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. When you write it down, you clearly see everything that you have to do that's of importance. And I always tell people, when you make a list of things you got to do, once you make that list, number it in order of most significant to most, you know, mm-hmm. it can it can wait to get done. Yeah. And by doing that, you eliminate that idea of having a multitask. And I've said this before, we as humans, we are not naturally made to multitask. Mm-hmm. As much as we try, as much as we think we're good at it, some people can sit there and say they're multitask experts, we are not. Mm-hmm. We are more we are more effective when we give each individual task our full divided attention, our full undivided attention. So writing things down, goal setting. And, you know, part of that is, you know, you should always make short term, midterm and long term goals for yourself, whether, you know, you're a student athlete or everyday adult, whatever the case may be, making setting goals. And by doing that is it kind of reaffirms, you know, part of self-care is affirmations, affirming to yourself that mm-hmm. hey i've completed this when i was when i started this in january i said i was gonna have it done by march well march mm-hmm. is here i got it done cool i know i can do things when i set it when i set a goal and i put my mind to it so that importance of having goals for the short term the inter- intermediate and long term mm-hmm. are extremely important for helping time management because now you can prioritize what things need to be accomplished in a more timely manner mm-hmm. um, and one of my last tips um, before i pass it over back to dr pitts is stress management you know, being able to take time away and understand that, you know, the stress I'm putting on myself, like what's really going to happen if I if, if I don't do as good as I think I'm going to do or if, it, if I don't meet this crucial deadline, like understanding that, look, sometimes we make we make the consequences worse than what they really are. Mm-hmm. Like take your time, find things that you can plug away from it, even if it's taking five or 10 minutes to listen to some music, go outside, uh, take a walk, take a break, take a quick shower, eat something. Whatever you can do to step away from the thing that's making you stress and manage that stress. Like if you know you have a stressful activity that you have to get done, Mm -hmm. well, set aside the adequate amount of time to Mm -hmm. avoid stressing yourself out and putting that pressure on you. Like I have this has to be perfect or it has to be done a correct way. Set aside that time. And then after that, do something fun. Yeah. Something fun, unplug and then go back. So those are some of my quick tips. Dr. Pitts, what are some of your tips? So one of the main ones that um, I find that's the most effective and certainly something that I, I required of Andre is to plan everything. So mm-hmm. what I mean by that is using a planner or a calendar, um, you know, everybody's Gen Z and, is, and the millennials, everybody's using uh, digital or electronic devices. Use a Google calendar or um, a, a Outlook calendar that on your laptop or other electronic device that syncs to your phone and literally plan everything you want to put in your calendar okay i've got you know i've got training from this window of time i have practice from this window of time i have um uh, therapy you know um training you know from this period of time you know if you've got an injury and you got to go so literally put physically on your digital calendar what you're planning out, including your fun, you know, you want to put on there, you know what, on Mondays, I get to spend from nine to 930 with my booth thing. On Tuesdays, I get to spend 10 to 12 and literally allocate your time effectively, because that is going to be instrumental in helping you to really harness your day um, to day to day avoid procrastination. Procrastination ties into planning everything, right? Because Mm -hmm. now you've allocated this time and you have to make it up in your mind that you're going to be disciplined. Don't take on too many responsibilities at one time. Don't don't be this consummate overachiever that's suffering from burnout because you end up being, um, it ends up being counterproductive to what you want to accomplish. 
Um, the other things that I'm just going to rattle them off real quick is, and you said, you know, start with your goals. Make sure that you set realistic goals. Use um, the smart approach to goal setting. You want to make them manageable. You want to make them realistic. You want to make sure that you can manage them according to your time. And make sure in that calendar you schedule time for homework. Take notes in class so that you're not having to read or do whatever it is that you were supposed to do in class. It's already done and you're just taking notes on it. Here's a key one, Ronnie, a big one. Have someone to hold you accountable. Yeah. You have to have someone that is really good at effectively managing time and humble yourself and allow them to hold you accountable for how you're managing your time. Um, you want to take really good care of yourself. And as it relates to time management, it's the final thought, and then I'll close this out. You want to remember why you're there. Remember why you're in college. Remember what this whole experience is all about and let that be a motivator for you of why managing your time effectively is so important. I'm going to give you this final tip. I use a, a traffic light um, approach to time management where the green light items, those are the absolute must do's today. Mm -hmm. There's, they are non-negotiable. I have to get these things done today. The yellow light are those things that don't necessarily have to be done today, but they have to be done within three days, right? And then those red item things are those things that are a week or more out, right? But as you're taking things off of your list, you want to slot, just like a light changes in the traffic, you mm -hmm. want to slide those things over because that is going to serve to help you to prioritize. Because, for example, by the time those red things move over to green, it's going to be time to do them right yeah. but you can like be that. taking steps along the way i've been using the traffic light approach to time management because i'm anal i'm anal about time management anybody know like i'm anal about time management so you you use that approach and it can be really really instrumental in helping you like that one. to get things to use that. Yeah, it's good it works i've been using it for years so on that note folks thank you for joining us another day another saturday on HT pregame. Um, next Saturday is our last show before Ronnie and I go on summer break and then we'll be back um, at the beginning of August. So you'll be getting reruns on HSRN. And we'll, I'll, what I'll do um, each week is I'll post um, the clip from, I'll just randomly, I'm not even gonna do them in order, Ronnie. I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna go all the way back to the shows we did like two years ago. I'm just gonna randomly each week just sort of do any meeny and post shows that I believe um, are relevant and that will truly be an encouragement to our viewing and our listening audience. So until next week, folks, we wish you a phenomenal, phenomenal remainder of your weekend. Be kind to one another, love one another, be deliberate and intentional in meeting each other in a place of common humanity with an open mind and an open heart. Take care of yourselves. Give the people that you love and care about their roses while they can smell them. We'll see you next week, folks. Have a good weekend.